So this is a different kind of talk. Dr. Gutikana asked me to talk a little about a little bit about skull-based surgery. How did we? How did I? You know, come upon it, or how did it come upon me? And uh, a little bit about uh, innovation in surgery uh, and so forth. And uh, this, of course, uh, the message will have a relevance to all of you. Uh, and I have also put in there something about my background. Uh, it's not a rags to riches story, but it's a it's a long, long story. Uh, so it'll be you'll see. Uh, sometimes what seems like adversity, and I keep reminding myself of that all the time. What seems like something bad is actually good for you because it really, really builds up a lot of strength. So this, by the way, is uh, Seattle skyline. Those who haven't been there. This is the Space Needle, which was built uh, for the World's Fair, 1960, I think 53 or 63, I don't remember. Uh, they just are doing a massive renovation. So when you go up on top of the Space Needle, uh, there's very thick glass. You can actually look down. If you, are, if you have uh, agoraphobia, you, you will have a problem because you can see all the way down. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, right near that space, well, there's a restaurant there which it spins around, but uh, right next to it is a, a museum called the Chihuly Museum. Chihuly is something I'd never heard of before, before I went to Seattle. Dale Chihuly is, uh, is a guy who's a blown glass artist, and he works with uh, glass blowing. And once you've seen one of his wicker works, then you'll recognize it in many places, in Las Vegas, many hotels, uh, various casinos, all these things. Maybe even in, uh, uh, here in Shreveport, you may have in the uh, in lobby, there may be some big, uh, you know, one of these blown glass works. And uh, he uh, is someone who created this uh, works of art, made of blown glass, and uh, so he created a whole school Actually, he's from Tacoma originally, which is not very far. And there, there's actually a blown glass museum where you go there and they, they show you. There's always somebody doing it, so you can see how they're doing it. And uh, so that's the uh, Chihuly Museum is there, and it's very worthwhile to see. Uh, in the background, you see Mount Rainier, and we have, of course, uh, uh, Mount Rainier is a volcanic mountain. It's a, Second tallest mountain in the continental in the United States uh, after uh, the uh, uh, Mount McKinley in Alaska. That's the tallest uh, mountain, and uh, the mountain in uh, Oregon, of course, blew its top. It was actually pretty, pretty uh, tall once one point. So Mount Rainier at some point will explode and send a lot of ashes up into the you know into the sky. Uh, Seattle skyline is changing a lot, mainly because of uh, construction, which is being mediated by Paul Allen, who recently died, and Amazon moving back to Seattle downtown, and they have massive expansion. Uh, so there's a lot of new buildings being built. So this is our University of Washington. Uh, they, this area uh, is a big uh, promenade. In the in the university is a green university, and uh, these uh, these are Japanese cherry blossoms, and uh, they were gifted to uh, the University of Washington by a very uh, grateful Japanese uh, student uh, who was admitted to the University of Washington, I guess, in the early twentieth uh, century. So he uh, made a gift, and they're there, as you know, uh, Seattle has a very checkered past in terms of its, uh, let's say, colonial history. Uh, a lot of the Japanese, I mean, as a whole, our USA had, uh, has its problems. Uh, a lot of Japanese were inter interred. Uh, they were uh, uh, summarily imprisoned for no fault of theirs during the Second World War. And many of them were placed uh, in camps in Seattle, and some of them were sent out to Idaho and so forth. Uh, so we don't have uh, always, we have not always had a, a good history with Japanese, but we, we have a very big uh, Asian population uh, in uh, Seattle. 
And uh, the, uh, um, at the present time, almost 20% of the students are of Chinese origin. So we have a huge number of Chinese uh, origin students in uh, University of Washington. So just a bit about uh, nothing about disclosure. So I was born in a, um, a city called Madras, which is now called Chennai which is a city which is actually, uh, was not a huge historic city, it was made a uh, very big city by the British, who established as a uh, major port for all of South India. I grew up in a small town called Dharmapuri. Dharma, you know what Dharma means. Uh, Dharma can mean different things to different people, uh, but it really means uh, it's considered the universal law of God. So what does it, what does Dharma mean? That you just, do unto others as you would like to be done to you. So that's all it is. It's a, the essence of dharma. So it means you do, uh, you treat others like the way you like to be treated in every possible way. That includes, but uh, according to Hindu Buddhist philosophy, it includes not only human beings, but also animals, plants, earth, everything. Puri is a place where it is practiced. So theoretically, it's a place where dharma is practiced. Um, Oh, and uh, I went, however, to uh, a Jesuit college in Madras, and uh, then Madras Medical College. I came to uh, uh, U.S. in uh, 19, into 1974, uh, and I left uh, India at the time because there was very severe, uh, what we call reverse discrimination. You know, you're sort of talking now about uh, affirmative action and there's uh, a lot of talk about Harvard, uh, you know, favoring or uh, being against Asians and so on and so forth. But uh, there was a reformist there in the south of India. He started uh, some reverse discrimination, and that became institutionalized. And then it was capped, it was you know held on to by politicians. I just so happened that it affected me, so I, I so I had to leave. The time. So this is uh, some just some pictures of. Uh, this is Tamil Nadu, and this is uh, Chennai or Madras, which is where um, I went to college and I was born. But uh, the place where I grew up is right about here, more central, uh, a bit like Shreveport, I guess. And then uh, this is a, a statue. This is a, an ancient king. He was a, one king that we know who lived in that place. But this is a very famous poet. So in uh, old India, there were a lot of women that were very prominent. Where they were intellectuals, and they, uh, they were poets, and so on. And uh, this woman uh, is very famous in uh, Tamil lore. She's called Avayar. Uh, and so he's presenting her with uh, something, whatever. And uh, right near uh, Dharmapuri, there's a river uh, Kaveri, which is a very famous river, and there's a huge falls you can go, and there's a small area where you can actually bathe in it, and uh, and you can see here, of course, uh, monkeys. Uh, this is uh, Loyola College, Madras, uh, Jesuit institution. Uh, Jesuits have been extremely; uh, they've done very good service, uh, provide good service, uh, especially in, in India. They they were all over the, they were in Japan, they were uh, everywhere. They basically had institutions of uh, education. They're affiliated with uh, Catholic uh, religion. I don't know if you have any Jesuits here, but uh, there have been some, recently some scandals involving Catholic uh, priests also in India, but uh, similar to, you know, here. Um, and uh, this is uh, Chennai, uh, which is, you know, you're right on the beach, beautiful beaches there. This is my alma mater, Madras Medical College. This is, uh, all these were different blocks. This is called anatomy block, and uh, you just go to anatomy, uh, learn anatomy here. Physiology was another block. This is the hospital. Uh, you can see what it looks like. So I did uh, my residency at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, and uh, and I trained under this uh, very charismatic and great surgeon, uh, Dr. Peter Janetta. He was the chair. Uh, but we had uh, I had 
some other very good, really good mentors, including Dr. Berdogiros, Joe Maroon, uh, Paul Nelson, I'll tell you about in a minute, you, whom you not know. Uh, during my training, I kind of already knew that I wanted to be a cerebrovascular surgeon. So all of my research was in cerebrovascular surgery, and I spent some time uh, with uh, Charlie Drake as like a in-training fellowship. So I went and you know well, was worked with uh, was in his uh, unit. Um, and when I finished uh, training. <clears throat> I was interested in cerebrovascular surgery and I went here and there looking for jobs and I couldn't find anything that was suitable and, uh, and at that, around that time Professor Majid Sami came uh, to us because he was a friend of Peter Janara and he gave us a lecture and I was so impressed with this man and uh, Majid Sami was uh, uh, at least at one time he was a very big expert in peripheral nerves you know he had trained with Hanno Milesi who is a plastic surgeon a lot of work with peripheral nerve surgery. So I accepted the fellowship uh, ostensibly to do peripheral nerve surgery. However, uh, Majid had shifted his focus to this and started turning his attention to this new area which he called skull based surgery around that time. Incidentally, I had some exposure during the, the, uh, my, after I finished training to a patient who had no carotids, no hearing, just two vertebrals, and a very complex aneurysm, uh, today may be treated even by uh, pipeline, actually presented with ruptured, ruptured aneurysm, and uh, we could manage it, but we just didn't have a way to expose it properly. We didn't have a way to get to the front. We, we were dealing with it from the back, and it was a disastrous uh, uh, situation. Uh, we were able to clip, clip the aneurysm eventually, but after it ruptured and uh, we didn't have really good control and so forth. And uh, we also had a bunch of, quote, skull-based tumors. We didn't call them that that time. Uh, Dr. Maroon used to have a bunch of these cases and uh, he'd say, Sheikh, uh, you just take this out and I'll come back a little later. And I'll be working somewhere. God only knows where I was, but I was just taking out tumor. So this was going on and uh, it was obvious that there's something of an interesting area to work on. So I went to uh, do fellowship with Majid Sami. Uh, when I went there, he, he had moved from peripheral uh, nerve surgery. Well, he had a lot of cases, but it was not his primary interest. And uh, he became a, a mentor, a real father figure uh, to me and uh, there was some connection there because you know he's of Persian origin and I'm, I'm Indian and maybe I look like him, I don't know. But he's much smarter looking and you know, much, uh, much more suave. Uh, he uh, used to lecture me, lecture me a lot and he said, Sheikh, uh, you know, Sheikh, you know, you wouldn't call me Sheikh, he didn't really know what to call me. He said, Lolly gum, he said, uh, listen, Cerebrovascular surgery, look at Charlie Drake, look at Dr. Yasegel. Everything that has can be achieved has been achieved. So don't go into that field. Take this one, this is new. <coughs> you know. I also made a nice friendships with some of his <coughs> colleagues and mentors and uh, Ricardo Ramina who is now in Brazil, Sepernia who is uh, in Germany. Some of these, these two people have died. <coughs> And, but he, uh, Majid, really introduced the concept of interdisciplinary co cooperation. You know, he had the idea of collaborating with ENT, oral maxillofacial, so on and so forth. He used to have some congresses and so forth. Uh, and uh, around, right about this time, Vinko Dolenz, who had also been to Pittsburgh once to give a lecture, published a paper on direct surgery of the cavernous sinus uh, tumors. Uh, this whole idea was uh, poo-pooed by Majid. He, he was not in favor of that. So uh, after I spent time with uh, Majid, I went to time, uh, spend some time with Ghazi Yasugil. And uh, Dr. Janetta gave me some money and said he could do, he could do whatever you want, you know, training. So, at that time, you know, he gave me like ten thousand dollars. That was a lot of money those days. So I started. I worked with Yasigil, where it was a com 
completely different experience in the operating room. You, you're in Majid's uh, operating room, you know, you're, you go walk in and you sit and there are four or five people sitting and then, <clears throat> and I used to actually work there, so you do a little craniotomy and then uh, Majid is not in the room, so everybody puts like a towel on, on top of the patient's head and everyone goes out and drinks co coffee or tea, tea and then Majid comes in, uh, you know, from one room to the other, he just, you know, he, he works for a few hours and then he goes. And then our Majid, you can ask Majid anything you want and he'll be talking to you and he'll be, you know. With Yazigil, it's a completely different story. So Yazigil and Diana, his uh, present wife, was a scrub nurse at the time. He had a tiny operating room, just about, you know, from there to there. So, and there was a glass uh, observation room right next to it. So they would bring the patient in, uh, you know, drape and everything, and then uh, we'll be all sitting over there, and Diana would say, no. So we all quietly, you know, we go, you know, by the side, and then there's one bench there. We used to sit there. When you're sitting on the bench, you can't move. You have to sit very still, and you can't speak. Uh, Yasir may speak to you, but you're not, you can't speak back. I didn't realize this at first because I was the only observer. He became very upset with me once I was speaking. And you can't move because it was bothering his vision. All these things are important because years later, I became a bit like Yasagil in the sense that I don't like to have music in the OR, I turn up the temperature. And I understood why he did all these things because he was trying to completely concentrate he immersed in himself into that patient, you know. Uh, when you're talking, just like as <clears throat> you're on the phone, on the talking and driving, your attention is not completely on the road, so he won't talk. You know, he is 100% devoted to that particular patient. So I understood what he was doing years later, but it's very different. But Yasigil is the first person that I saw, although I was interested and I figured out how to put the Sylvian Fisher, all these things when I was in Pittsburgh, I saw Yarsigil handle blood vessels like a, an Indian rope trick master. You know, he just knew brain anatomy so well and he didn't need navigation because he just knew where he was all the time. And it was just unbelievable. Um, and it, I mentioned that it's a very tense environment. I looked at all of his videotapes uh, he was very kind to me uh, for two reasons. One is that he, he was very fond of Peter Janetta, and then he liked my Indian origin. He didn't like Americans for some reason because he felt that they were always criticizing him behind his back. Uh, he had, you know, tremendous experience, influence on many, many people, but he, he had on me. On Fridays, usually he didn't operate, so he would send us <coughs> to observe uh, Professor Ugo Fish, whom you know, some of you know, is a very famous ENT neurotologist. And Ugo, uh, you know, we used to watch him, we'll go and watch him. Uh, he was a nice man. So this is interesting, uh, becomes interesting later. So I came back to Pittsburgh and I joined the faculty there. And uh, my primary role was uh, cerebrovascular surgery and some peripheral nerve surgery. But also I was working with Dr. Peter Janetta as his partner and doing a lot of microvascular decompression operations. Uh, I became introduced to the ENT surgeons at that time, mainly because of two reasons. Number one, they were constantly creating problems. The Dr. Vic Schramm got, kept getting into the carotid artery and creating, uh, you know, bleeding. Not much different from my current partner, by the way. Uh, and then uh, one uh, ENT neurotologist, uh, they would do translap surgery and they get into the brainstem or ICA or something, you know. And nobody in my department wanted to work with these guys because they were called the nose pickers. So that was a derog derogatory term for ENT surgeons. Um, but the ENT people, they adopted me because they heard that I had spent some time with Ugo Fish. And at that time, Ugo Fish was like a god in ENT surgery. So if you've been to God's temple, so they, they accept you as somebody, you know. And I had a lot of, uh, I was not the senior cerebrovascular surgeon. Uh, and so, but nobody else, nobody cared that I was working with these ENT guys. Um, 
So I was doing mainly research in cerebrovascular ultrasound in Pittsburgh. You can't get promoted unless you have grants. But I also started working on the field of skull base anatomy, but not like Dr. Al Roton. Dr. Al Roton is a real master of real anatomy. I was mainly working with skull base anatomy with the idea to develop some approaches, uh, strategies, and whatnot. So I had a small uh, old lab and I found a discarded Mayfield table and I somehow adapted it and I found a gentleman, a, very a nice man called Jan Hart. He also ran a funeral home business so he knew how exactly how to preserve cadaver heads and he had a technique which we're still using today. In fact, the technique that we started using and then I gave it to Dr. Rotan. He, he uh, adopted it you know, and using, uh, I think it uses, they use glyceraldehyde, so you don't have that strong uh, formal and smell, etc. Uh, and I did a lot of work with different things, Petrus uh, carotid anatomy, cavernous sinus, petroclavar region, frame magnum, and, and other regions, and every, so I had one uh, fellow who was from the Philippines, and I, I'm really not sure why he latched on to me, but, but I think he wanted to in the neurosurgery so he was always they were there on Saturday so we used to work together every Saturday I would spend from 8 till 4 o'clock just working in this lab and randomly uh, doing some dissections and uh, there were a lot of publications relating to Petrus carotid artery uh, temporal approaches cavernous sinus uh, and so on and so forth and in the process uh, I started inventing operations, basically because whatever, whenever there was a problem, I was able to relate to that and I was able to rearrange the chest pieces inside the head. Uh, for instance, we had this problem, you know, we, we take out a whole huge tumor, you have a carotid artery that's missing and you have a big hole, what do you do? So, well, okay, carotid artery, you can, if you find the other end in this end, you can put a vein graft. So we, I figured that out, that's not a big deal. But then what do you do with this big defect? So I went to attend a, a conference, it was kind of a conference, uh, international conference, uh, it was uh, held by one of the competitors of the University of Pittsburgh over in a private hospital uh, by the name of Sebastian Arena, he convened this conference and then suddenly the whole bunch of plastic surgeons were talking about microvascular free flaps. So they're talking about microvascular free flap for this, for, for, and I said well, why can't we apply these microvascular free flaps for the head? So I came back and I talked to our plastic surgeon. So we did the first uh, case. He was his name was Neil Jones. We, we did the use the first case, uh, and then we did a whole bunch of these uh, rectus abdominis and other flaps. He became very famous uh, because of this. Uh, so, but it, it's just uh, you know applying. It's like. Uh, um, uh, it said that the uh, the person uh, who was with Apple, I'll come to that in a minute, I met, uh, Dr. Who, he dropped out of college and then he took all these other courses and arts, this, that, and the other, and he was able to put everything together to come up with the, the idea of the iPhone. So that's kind of what happened to me by going, so in your education, don't restrict yourself to just neurosurgery. Look at what the cardiac surgeons, ENT surgeons, what the, you know, what the medical, different people, what do they do? You know, we don't really, because we become so compartmentalized that we're not really paying attention to all these things, right? So I started working a lot with Dr. Vic Schramm and, uh, but suddenly one day Vic came up and said to me, uh, Sheikh, uh, I decided to go in private practice. I'm going to Denver and they're sitting in this beautiful, uh, skull based institute for me and I'm not going to be here anymore. I said, What's, uh, what? I said, what are we going to do now? So then I went and talked to the chairman of ENT who was very fond of me and uh, he said, okay, let's recruit somebody. We were just so lucky to found, uh, find Evo Janica who was not only board certified in oralaryngology but also in plastic surgery and he wanted to work in this field. So then I said, I came up with this idea of a center for skull-based surgery. It didn't exist anywhere in the world. I said, well, let it have dual uh, directorship. You know, let's give equal importance to myself and to the ENT. 
Uh, and so we, we set core directors and then we created a board that had uh, radiology uh, and so on and so forth. It was like a company, essentially. But the idea was, uh, you know, collaboration. And we also, you know, created a, came up with a book. And uh, my associates in skull base surgery, Dr. Sen and Donald Wright, we started having fellows. <clears throat> in fact, Dr. Anil Nanda was uh, kind of a fellow of us uh, sometime at uh, one point. He was also a fellow with Dr. Janetta. Uh, and uh, we developed a lot of fruitful uh, collaborations uh, with multiple people in our institution. We kind of found well, whatever we wanted, we went and found them. We, we found those people. They were so happy to work, uh, you know, in this field. We weren't thinking about billing, uh, collecting anything. We just wanted to, you know, solve the problem for the patient. So, Doctor, in the meanwhile, Dr. Al Rotan, uh, whom you all know, and all, just about all neurosurgeons know, he became very interested in my work because mine was a little different from what he was doing. He was trying to to create the details of the anatomy that neurosurgeons do, but I was trying to use anatomy to create new surgical approaches and new surgical uh, techniques. Uh, and he became a great mentor and a, and a friend. And he, we met uh, in several courses and discussed approaches. He even offered me a job. Uh, he was just a, truly a great master in neurosurgery. Now, I want to say something about the atmosphere at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, it was a very, very different uh, place. Uh, Dr. Peter Janetta, he's a very innovative, very confident uh, person, uh, and uh, just about all neurosurgeons are like that, but he was, had a special air of confidence. And he promoted new ideas and development in his young faculty. That's what something, you know, he didn't say, hey, uh, don't do this, don't do that. But, you know, as long as you are not creating major complications, you could do whatever you want. But, as you may expect, you know, once you became very prominent, sometimes he also, you know, became a little bit jealous of you, but it's just not, just human. He's a very charismatic, great surgeon, and a great mentor. Now, one of the early people that he promoted, our, our very innovators, was Dr. Dade Lunsford. Dr. Dade Lunsford, uh, you know, is the first one who invented the intraoperative CT scanner. He installed a second gamma knife in Pittsburgh, and, and he single-handedly popularized the gamma knife because he did a lot of scientific studies that established that the gamma knife actually works, and wh whom it does work for, what are the dosing, this, that, and the other. Uh, Dade and I were competitors in our push disease because here he was talking about giving radiation to cure something and I was talking about taking the whole thing out. However, we were also very good friends because he was two years senior to me and uh, we used to play tennis together and we had a great deal of respect for, uh, you know, what the other person was doing. Uh, Dr. Ladislaw Steiner, I don't know if you know, some of you know, he was a true pioneer in gamma knife. He also uh, is from Karolinska. He was in our department for a while. Dr. Ted Kersey, it's interesting, Dr. Kersey is from UCLA, no, USC, and he was uh, Dr. Janetta's teacher. When he retired, he came to Pittsburgh and spent a couple of years there, and he loved what I was doing. He would come and watch me operate, and he would give some comments. Uh, you know, he had a lot of positive comments about what I was doing, uh, and a uh, very nice man. And then we had two neurophysiologists, Augie Moeller and Robert Scobasi. They collaborated in a lot of uh, research, clinical research. However, uh, at the same time, we had a, a reaction in uh, Pittsburgh, because uh, definitely skull-based surgery at the time was creating complications. So we'd have somebody with a big infection or stroke or hemorrhage or, or some cranial neuropathy, whatever. And there were some uh, in our department that were actually gunning for me, pretty much. And uh, so uh, Dr. Paul Nelson, who was about three years my senior, became you know, like the vice chair of the department. He rose pretty quickly, and but he was, uh, he saw the future of this field. He saw what I was doing and he said, Sheikh, you, we got to support you. So, and very interesting ha thing happened. Uh, someone complained to Dr. Janetta 
that uh, Dr. Shaker is uh, reporting results which are not uh, true. He is, uh, patients are doing very badly and he's writing these papers saying that patients are doing such and such. So Dr. Janetta brought this up to me uh, once in my meeting. And Paul Nelson said, okay, uh, let's just have a review of your patients, you know. So I said, okay, he said, give me a list of your last uh, 100 patients and whatever you have. We had a database, by the way. And then I'm gonna have our own QI nurses. By the way, all of our database was compiled by a nurse. We had a research nurse practitioner who used to work with me, by the name of Lois Buckhart. <clears throat> I'm gonna give it to the hospital QI nurses. I'm gonna have them call these patients and find out how they're doing. So they did that, and it was 100% on the money. So Dr. Janetta shut up. After that, he never said anything. And uh, that was a very valuable lesson for me in life, that if you want to have, uh, a, if you want to publish your results that are something dramatic, you need external validation. It's not enough that if you are reporting something, and even if your own nurse, because everybody is biased, right? So you need some external validation. That was a very good thing. Uh, I also established uh, what's called a skull base lab in Pittsburgh because I found that uh, our residents needed more education. They needed to do better in the operating room. And once they established a the lab, the same thing happened at GW. Once we have a lab, they started to do better in the operating room because they already done all these things in cadavers. We also de developed a fellowship uh, which uh, was very competitive. Just a couple of examples. This was one of the early cases, uh, an impossible clivus meningioma. This young, this uh, lady, she was about in her 50s. She uh, came, I don't even know where she came from, but uh, was getting worse and worse. And she came pretty much almost quadriplegic, she had multiple cranial nerve palsies, and she had this uh, type of tumor, which is heavily calcified, and at that time we didn't have MRI scan, but you can see the dark darkness in the brain, which indicates it's invaded. Uh, basal artery is in the center of this tumor, you can see that, this is uh, narrowed. So my initial idea was, okay, let's just go subtemporal and then maybe some debug some tumor and then we give some radiation. So uh, we went in subtemporally, and uh, what I found is that here's the basal artery coming right out, and this is a heavily calcified and very difficult tumor. So there's no way to do anything, and I, we came out and almost nothing was done. So in the meantime, I'd been working in the lab, so I said, uh, let's just take out the temporal bone so we can expose the tumor. So we took out the temporal bone, her facial nerve was already, she had paralysis of the face and there was no way to be found, but you know, facial nerve was damaged. We eventually did a graft, but we were able to expose the tumor just like in the petrous carotid artery, we displace it forward. The tumor was exposed just like you would have a convexity tumor. So now I could work on the basilar artery, uh, freeing it up from the tumor, getting the tumor out, and we were able to do that. Uh, the lady still has a facial paralysis, face didn't recover, but uh, she recovered uh, very well, this, this patient. So this is uh, what I call an index case. This is uh, an approach which kind of developed from that. It's called subtemporal infratemporal approach, where we move the petrus aside and uh, leave the hearing intact, etc. for we can use for a tumor like this, uh, petroclival chondrosarcoma. Uh, and uh, so, here's what I was talking about, uh, the attacks from the right and left. Dr. Nelson, I told you already about this case. <clears throat> but radio surgery around this time became a viable alternative for small and residual uh, skull-based tumors. And Dr. Lunsford gave this talk at the academy, it's called Gamma Knife Surgery, the Requiem of Skull-Based Surgery. So that was his... Uh, a view of the future that skull base surgery will be knocked out because of gamma knife. It hasn't happened. Uh, skull base surgery became a standard part and many uh, senior neurosurgeons like Dr. Robert Ojeman, he was very critical, but he became a very good friend. He actually wrote a very strong editorial in uh, 
general neurosurgery, saying skull-based surgery is only creating deficits and problems. But then uh, somebody came from Mass General to train under me and then went back. So every place sent, started sending people to train, and once they trained and went back, then they established centers of their own. Uh, so many skeptics became enthusiasts. My, one of my first courses on cavernous sinus and skull-based surgery was held at the AANS, and guess what? I was shaking under my boots because both Dr. Charlie Wilson and Dr. Charlie Drake were tra taking that course. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said, shake, uh, sh you know, show us what you do, and you know, is something I wish I had pictures of it, I just don't. But it's just the moments that I remember. But around this time, of course, uh, there were other places, Dr. Almefti, of course, Dr. Janaka and others uh, were establishing centers and we were going around giving lectures and so on. Uh, the ENT surgeons accepted skull-based surgery much more readily than their neurosurgical counterparts. I'm not sure why that is the case, but they saw, they accepted it much uh, earlier. So in 1986, we held a meeting in Denver by Dr. Vic Schramm to bring together groups of people around the country. There were about 10 or uh, 12 groups that were doing this. The initial was to, uh, idea was to establish a skull-based study group, which consisted of multiple groups of surgeons who were collaborating uh, in this thing. But Dr. Rotan was there, he said, what's the point of having a group? Once you establish a society, then you know there'll be more people join and they'll see what it's about and so on. So a very important thing is that we created a democratic constitution with the presidency were to rotate between ENT, neurosurgery, and uh, other disciplines, which would be plastics, radiology, whatever. We elected Dr. Paul Donnelly, the very well-known ENT surgeon from UC Davis, as the first president. He was much older than me. He looks really presidential and decided being a great surgeon. And uh, we had meetings in different places. And we had a gentleman by the name of Cohn Peavy House. He was a neurosurgeon who was, uh, used to be at UVA. And he helped us to get these skull base codes. We, we established codes with the help of North American Skull Base Society. We got them incorporated through the AMA so that they can be paid. And the codes were approach, surgery, and reconstruction. Three separate codes. If you look now, you know, these codes are separate. Uh, and it was very important because if you don't get paid, you're not going to do the surgery. So uh, this was very, very important and essential. So the, the North American Skull Base Society was a very good uh, group because it was to, pro to promote collaboration, information, to perform outcome trial studies, clinical trials, etc. And eventually the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies was in the same adopted many of the same constitution of the North American survey site. So there were two competing groups in the world. One was the Sami group, but the other was the FISH group. So, uh, and I was of course part of the Sami group, but I was very friendly with the FISH group. Uh, but eventually, after some negotiation, they were merged to form the World Federation of the Skull-Based Societies. The meetings are held every four years. Uh, however, the, the scientific rigor was never the same, is not the same because whenever, whoever sends a paper, they accept it. There's no screening of any kind, you know, and that's the way world, world societies are often are. Now, the same idea of tumor surgery, these approaches, uh, I realized early on, can be adopted to aneurysm surgery. And Dr. Mefti as well, he had the same idea. Uh, and, uh, but in the beginning, there was a lot of skepticism from established cerebrovascular surgeons, but gradually all of them uh, accepted this. Um, and they also, so this is just an example of a case from George Washington University Hospital. This 15-year-old uh, girl presented with progressive symptoms, uh, and she became gradually uh, pretty quadriplegic, uh, quadriparatic. And she had this giant aneurysm. A lot of it is thrombos. You don't see the thrombus. And it's a lower and mid basilar aneurysm supplied by uh, a very dominant vertebral artery. So um, there's no way to clip this. Uh, I think even today, this would be very difficult to treat it with a pipeline device, which might be a consideration here. 
mirror, really a long uh, device, but also there's a lot of thrombus inside. And uh, so my initial idea was, okay, let's put a vein graft in, into the PCA. <coughs> and I must say that at that time I was not as good as, I wasn't using radial artery grafts, and I probably was, the vein graft is too big for that PCA. So I tried that, the, the graft plotted off right away. In the meanwhile, the patient is going down and down and much getting much worse. And she has very small pecoms. So I decided maybe to try something never tried before, to put a saphenous vein graft directly into the basilar artery beyond the aneurysm. But of course you have to stop the flow, so you need to do uh, cardiac arrest. But you need exposure. <clears throat> How do you suture something if you can't expose it? So I went and talked to the family and I said, well, listen, this operation has never been done before. And I think the patient is a 50-50 chance of making it. Uh, and they said, go for it, doctor. You know, and uh, my partner, Dr. Wright, Don Wright, had a more realistic view. He said, Shake, this patient maybe is like a 10% chance that she will make it with this operation. And he was probably correct because he was much more realistic. So we did the operation in two stages. First stage was spectrosectomy to expose the aneurysm uh, with Don Wright and David Schessel, who's a neurotologist. On a Saturday in the second stage, we did the bypass under deep hypothermic cardiac arrest. So here is the uh, operating room one in the old GW hospital. This hospital has been torn down, new hospital exists. And uh, here we are, three surgeons, uh, Shessel, Wright, myself, and uh, there's an observer, ob observer dome on top. From there you can take some pictures so you can see what it looks like. And the microscope uh, is in the corner. You can see the old uh, NC31 microscope. Uh, so the idea was to take out the entire uh, temporal bone, move the facial nerve back, sacrifice hearing, move the carotid forward, then you have this entire nice exposure, and then under the deep hypothermic circulatory arrest, we just take the vein graft and then go right into the basal artery, and then just empty the aneurysm, because the aneurysm causing mass effect. And, uh, this is kind of what uh, the picture is taken during that, and here is the, the graft coming in, and this is the aneurysm, and so forth. Well, this patient started getting better. Uh, so somebody asked me, how do you perform suturing at the depth without being nervous? Uh, you're suturing the basal or the saphenous vein graft to the basal or to the basal artery. I would say that focus only on the next stitch focus on the next stitch. You know you have a goal in mind, but your focus is only on the next stitch. Just get the next stitch in. So this is, uh, she has now been followed for more than 25 years. She has a slight weakness. You can't tell which side is weaker, which is actually slightly weaker on the right. Uh, and uh, of course she has complete hearing loss. She works full time. She finished master's, etc. Uh, this giant ACOM aneurysm uh, in time aspect approach. I think it's similar to what I showed you earlier. Uh, I wonder if the video works. No, it doesn't matter. I think it's not so important. So now uh, enter uh, endoscopic surgery. I had very little to do with that other than the fact that I used the endoscope a lot, even at that time in Pittsburgh to do endoscope assisted surgery, but uh, Dr. Haydon Joe, who used to work in Pittsburgh, was the pioneer, the true pioneer, and this man was very important for endoscope assisted surgery. This is Dr. Joe. And these are all guys from Pittsburgh, and uh, this is, uh, these are a group from uh, New York and Brazil and so forth, and uh, a lot of uh, developments in endoscopic surgery, which is advantages to this way. I won't go into the details of this. This talk is not about that. Uh, certainly the complications of microsurgery are a lot, lot less nowadays than they used to be for skull base. So just briefly a word about radial artery and other bypasses. So in 1985, I became interested in uh, vein grafts for carotid artery replacement. But in 1995, uh, I started to use vein grafts, but they started to develop vasospasm. Uh, and uh, this was a big problem for cardiac surgeons as well. So one of my 
uh, colleagues and former fellows, he mentioned that one of the Japanese surgeons used to keep the radial artery filled with saline before usage. So I said, okay, maybe if we push them under pressure, the graft will release a spasm, and that's how we accidentally invented this technique. So I started also to develop some techniques of local bypasses, and Mike Lawton uh, has done a lot of work. And then brain bypass surgery courses conducted by, at St. Louis University by Salim Abdulraf brought many international experts together, just like Kalbe's study group. And then, so this field has had many, and this is a technique that I already showed you this morning uh, about that. Um, what, what are uh, further treatments and what, are, what developments may occur in this field, two fields, are endoscopic and endoscope assisted surgery, we've seen that, but a lot of specialized instruments for that. Uh, the use of robots is only the beginning. I've done some work, research work with that. I'm also developing a robot, robotics assistant, that's just in the beginning. Of course, endovascular is a big thing nowadays and it's going to get keep getting more and more. Different radiation techniques, immunological treatments as you know, CAR T cells and whatnot. Uh, gene therapy is just at the beginning so we'll be able to prevent or alter many of these uh, problems. Uh, AI, artificial intelligence robotics, is, is going to revolutionize all aspects of our lives. It, our jobs will change. I think many of the repetitive jobs will be done by AI-enabled robots. So creativity and innovation will be very important. Many jobs involving patient care, such as cleaning, nursing, follow-up care, physician communication, indication of treatment, cost of care, everything will change due to the inception of AI. Hospitals will be very different. Today's hospital, gone. The hospital will be different. It'll have, it'll be green. It'll have rooms that are tailored to the patient. It'll have ro AI, robots, etc., And uh, it'll have environment that'll be uh, different. As soon as the patient enters, all the bacteria that are in the patient's, part of the patient's flora will be diagnosed. And then the right kind of treatment will be instituted for the patient right away. This is what I think is going to happen. So I, I want to uh, talk a little bit about something very intangible. So I, I try to go inside and see what what is it that I've been very lucky in certain things. I mean, all of you have different experiences like this. What allowed me to innovate? Is it just being at the right place at the right time? Uh, I, I believe that uh, I have a very firm belief in uh, divine or spirituality, spiritual and prayer, and so I was in trouble so many times, believe me, and uh, I would pray. Um, a collaborative environment. So I found that, you know, this is a great country. What a great country it is. When you, find, when you think that one man is against you, you find that 20 people are for you. So you just have to find those 20 people and collaborate. You know, when I started to look for neurosurgical residencies, I was at Cook County Hospital. And a uh, neurosurgeon, great neurosurgeon, whom I, who was a chief, he said to me, uh, Dr. Shaker, he said, uh, we, you are a very good man, we like you very much, but we don't like foreign graduates to come to this country and take our jobs. I like to encourage women and minorities, and uh, you know, uh, so I was so depressed, and I didn't know what to do for like a week. Then I had a bunch of colleagues as a sheikh. Don't worry about this place. Maybe the other places will give you a job. Why don't you go and ask him uh, if he'll write your letter of recommendation? So I went to him and said, "Will you write a letter?" Of I, he said, "I'd be more than happy to write a letter of recommendation. Nice one to anyone." And guess what? Some doors open for me. So that's something that I found. So find the right team. This is very, very important. In your life, in your workplace, find the right team. And be a part of the team. It's important to have 
uh, some knowledge about other fields. So what I, the person I was talking about was Steve Jobs. He has, if you read his book, what he says is that how do you invent this great iPhone? You know, there was flip phones. They looked nothing like the iPhone. And then he came up with this great device. He realized that artistry was as important as technology. So take some interest in other fields. Uh, of course, for all innovators, there is a degree of courage and risk-taking behavior. This may be more and more difficult nowadays. I mean, because we are, we have thousands of people walk, watching us, and uh, taking the risk is not easy. I understand. I realize that. Uh, ability to identify problems and prioritize them, and and uh, leaders, some leaders like Paul Nelson. Who who knows about Paul Nelson? Very few people know about Paul Nelson. But Paul Nelson was a great leader. He saw something, he knew that this was going to be very important, and he, he helped me. So, Dr. Janetta, you know, various people. And uh, family is very important. So, uh, this is my older son, Raj, Daniela, Chris, my wife, Gordona. And uh, these are all family. Dr. Rich Ellenbogen, Dr. Lunsford, Dr. Goatke, this is Dr. Mukherjee, he's a vascular surgeon. I talk to him a lot about different problems and he, we are very good friends because we used to play cricket together. And here we are uh, watching cricket in uh, England. So what promotes innovation in medicine, especially in the surgical fields? So new ideas come about because of scientific thinking but unrestrained imagination. All of us have this quality of imagination. It's been found that imagination is not unique to human beings. It exists in monkeys and chimpanzees, and artificial intelligence systems can also develop imagination, so they reproduce it. So it's not something unique, it, it, is, it exists. So developing an idea into any idea into something practical, however, requires sustained effort, any, both in biological and physical sciences. More effort is needed in medicine because of patient safety concerns. Even Einstein, Einstein came up with this incredible uh, idea, earth-shaking idea about this general theory of relativity. Then suddenly he found he didn't have enough mathematics, he didn't know enough mathematics to to develop it. So he actually had to rely on some of his friends who were very good mathematicians. And uh, of course we are now waiting for the next Einstein or Bose or Bohr or, or Raman. Uh, these people are something much more phenomenal. Maybe CRISPR-Cas9, I think that's earth shaking. So, but the person who puts it all together is equally important. It's like the conductor of an opera or, or a symphony. Well, the symphony has all these incredible people, but someone who puts it together, you know, uh, like, uh, let's say, Beethoven, he wrote all these things in his mind, and he could see it somehow, all these things. Still, when, uh, you know, uh, a famous conductor conducts it, one is different from the other. I mean, that's important. So this requires unorthodox thinking and exposure to many things outside your own field. Story of just about everything in technology, to urge to excel, to compete, is not bad when such competition is constructive, like the space race. An atmosphere of open inquiry in debate is very important. So there are countries where you're not allowed to think freely. So you can do this, but you know, I think that you know, an atmosphere of open inquiry without damaging others is extremely important. Diversity in your workplace with respect to gender, race, religion is very important with equal opportunity. This is, I think, a very important thing. It leads to a very good culture of innovation. Forget everything else, just innovation I'm talking about. So, in, uh, in our Hindu uh, scriptures, the Maha Upanishad, it says, Vasudaiva Kutumbakam, that is, the whole universe is one family. So, it says that. So, so, our job, on the other hand, practicing neurosurgery is not just innovation. Innovation is only a tiny part. Most of it, what we do, 
is science, art, sales, administration, and risk management. And increasingly, it's administration and risk management. But sales is equally important. We have to sell ourselves to every patient that we meet. We have to sell ourselves to insurance company or doctors so they'll send us the patients, etc. Right? So um, all these activities are in our daily life. But the innovation keeps it interesting. Innovation may not be major, but many small things in your day-to-day -day work. It may relate to clinical neurosurgery, basic neurosciences, workflow and efficiency, outpatient hospital uh, infrastructure, QI, QI uh, patients, whatever it is. So the idea is we want to constantly strive to leave things better than how you find them. Is there a connection between religion, philosophy, and scientific progress? I believe there is. I think that religions and philosophies which encourage free thinking, they also promote the same in science. If you talk, if you read the writings of the Dalai Lama, he says, what is God? He said, let us have a discussion. We don't know. Let's discuss it. Maybe we'll, somebody will prove tomorrow there is no such thing, but let's discuss it and, and, uh, and have open inquiry. So this was the, the, the Hindu philosophers. They, they had this idea. They called them rishis. They, there is no such thing as a given book in the Hindu religion. They're all based on someone's meditation and thinking. So the techniques like yoga, meditation, tai chi, and other techniques, they prepare us. I think they're important for all neurosurgeons to be engaged in something like this because they prepare our minds for our work, which is very difficult, by the way, sometimes more than others. So in, uh, in one of our Upanishads, which is one of the big collection of uh, verses and philosophies. It says this, may all be prosperous and happy, may all be free from illness, may all see what is spiritually uplifting, may no one suffer, may all, everyone has uh, peace. Now, it's equally important to understand, and that's based on our philosophy, that every single person in the universe is important as important as the other. It, according to the Bhagavad Gita, it says, you have a right to perform your prescribed duties, but you're not entitled to the fruits of your actions. That means, do your duty, but don't concern yourself, don't, don't swell your head just because you think that you're a great neurosurgeon, you're a nurse, you're whatever. You do your job as well as you can, and that is dedication to God. And do not be, at the same time, don't be attached to inaction. So for that reason, you may say, why should I act? No, even if sometimes this comes up to us, because sometimes we have a patient who's in very bad shape. Patient's family is upset with you uh, about something. Totally, hospital, administration is uh, unhappy with you. You know, should we, we all feel like, oh gosh, why are we doing this? But listen. We, as neurosurgeons, doctors, nurses, we've been given this incredible job by the universe, by God, whatever, that makes us happy when we do them. So do that. Do, the, do your duty. That's all I had to say. Thank you very much. Kind of wanted to have any closing remarks or anything, but he must have stepped down. He might have stepped down, yeah. Does anybody have any questions? Comments? I have one question. Okay. Yes? Um, I know you mentioned that you've been using Safino's vein wraps in uh, uh, carotene artery surgery and then you changed to radial artery bypassing. And then you mentioned that one of the patients in which you use the SVG, the uh, graft busted. Not so, bad, rock. so my question is, since that happened, have you still been using your SVGs for your grafts? And what have you done differently? 
So the the Saffron's the question is like this. So I mentioned that Saffron's brain graft audit. So the Saffron's brain graft, the thing about it, the thing about it is that it carries a lot of flow. The caliber is much higher. So when you put it into a smaller vessel like the posterior cerebral artery or SC, the superior cerebral artery, there's a very big discrepancy in the graft, the flow between the, the graft and the artery that creates a lot of uh, turbulence. So um, I don't use, like to use it in the posterior circulation, but I still use it in the anterior circulation. Increasingly, I find that if you are not using the radial artery, maybe better take the anterior tibial, you know, if you can. Saffron's vein is pretty quick, you know, but it, it may have potentially more troubles in the long term because it's not a real arterial wall, you know, it's a venous wall, so it has develops more pathologies. Uh, it's pretty commonly used, obviously, in uh, cardiac, but they, they also prefer internal mammary followed by radial, and Saffron's vein is at the end, you know, so there. But yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for your talk, sir. Uh, yeah. As uh, young neurosurgeons that are just going to be graduating soon, do you have any uh, advice for us in terms of, uh, as it pertains to skull base, in terms of technologies or techniques that we should be looking at or paying attention to in the immediate future? I know you had uh, sort of the long term thing. Uh, I, I think that I really think that uh, you need to pay attention, this is what I was talking about, two areas in particular, AI and robotics and uh, uh, and uh, antibodies, antigens, and, and CRISPR-Cas9 related uh, gene therapy technologies. I think that if you start working on those 10 years from now, they bear a lot of fruit. I think anything in the immediate future, obviously, you know, we have microsurgery, we have endoscopic surgery, we'll have better instrumentation, so on and so forth. People are going to give it to you. But you want to invest yourself into something that 10 years from now will you would have made a contribution, I think, that those are the fields, in my opinion. Uh, but I may be wrong. Maybe something else entirely, you know. Another thing I forgot to mention, I'm sorry about this, but is skull based rehabilitation. We haven't paid enough attention, frankly, to rehabilitation of our patients. And I think that here, both working with the physical therapy, the, 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 the milieu rehab specialists, but also stem cell technologies, that's going to have a big impact. I, I didn't mention that at all. Uh, I should have said something about that, yeah. Yes, sir. I have a very personal question. Yeah. Um, you know, skull base has a lot of challenges, and you have, you know, you say you have two cases to do, and uh, first case, very, very bad complication, and um, the patient's outcome is not as you expected, and you have another very challenging skull base case, or and how do you shift modes, firstly, you know, from like being a junior attending to like you know, very experienced as you are? Like, how do you dissociate? Is there anything that you do differently? Uh, do you cancel cases? Or you know, uh, yeah. What do you do when you have a major complication? Is that the question? Right. And right. Then followed by another very important case. Um, yeah. I, I think that you need to retool yourself. What do I mean by that? You sort of go back, go back inside and find out why did that complication happen? You know, what was the reason? Was it just an act of God? Were you inadequately prepared? Wrong patient? You know, whatever. Maybe go back to the cadaver lab in between and try to work out something. You know, try to be objective. Maybe even talk to your colleagues, see if they have something to say. Uh, I think that all of these can be important. I, I wouldn't go if you're a young person, young neurosurgeon, and you have major complication, I wouldn't go right from that to another big case. I would try to really analyze what happened with that case. What could, you know, even today, even if I have a small complication, I'm thinking about what can I do differently. I think that this is where AI is going to become important because, for instance, now I have my experience. I know all the mistakes I made. But unfortunately, I'm not able to communicate all of those things to you, or to you, or to you. But with AI, we'll be able to download or put all that information into a collective database, and that AI is going to help you. Maybe in future, we'll be able to directly download that information into our brain. 
by some way, maybe implanted uh, epidural electrodes, implanted Google network. These are all things I'm thinking about, you know. But something, you know, we, we need to get beyond the idea that one person gains an extraordinary experience and then dies, and person number two has to, you know, make some of the mistakes again. So we need to break the cycle somewhere. And I think AI is going to do, help us with that. You know. And these technologies are brain-mind interface, which are already developing. You know. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. I just yes. have one question regarding yes, your comments uh, on robotics. Uh, robotics, yes. In my yes. career as a neurosurgeon, I, I felt like we've gone through two major revolutions already. The first one being the development of microsurgery. When I yep. first got started, everything was kind of done under loop magnification. And I remember Ron Applebaum came to the University of Utah and really showed us the microscope can be used on most things you do and with much, much improved results. And I think it had been the first revolution during my career. The second's been in the vascular, which I've not been part of, but uh, it's just the amazing development of what can be done now. Uh, the third revolution, I believe, is going to be robotics. And my question to you is, is robotics has already been around 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, primarily used by people who work in the abdomen and the pelvis in a fluid environment, where you'd think the robotics would not be as advantageous as a neurosurgeon who works in a fixed sphere of relatively stable anatomy. Yeah. And why is it, do you think that neurosurgery has now fallen so far behind in the development of uh, robotics in our subject? I think the, the main reason is that uh, our market is very small. So everything, as you know, all these uh, developments of companies and so on, they need money, and they need they invest money when the market is big. The market of neurosurgery is very small, and uh, you know, for instance, uh, Dr. is uh, from uh, Calgary. He uh, Jerry, uh, I forgot his name. He built this, uh, uh, you know, master uh, slave robot for neurosurgery, uh, but it's not found its way anywhere. Uh, I think just now we are doing more with spine robotics simply because the market is very big, and there's a real room for it because, uh, you know, we need somebody, something minimally invasive or less invasive, and at the same time, much more accurate. You know, we still, you know, with all of our technologies, uh, I was in the MNM conference yeah, two days ago, and one screw is a little bit into the canal, you know, and it's rubbing on the vertebral artery, and they have to replace the screw. Uh, uh, one screw is light right outside. So, uh, so we need better accuracy, at the same time less invasive. So, uh, and spine is an area where, you know, uh, obviously they can make a lot of money. Yeah. So that's where it's, uh, it's getting adopted. But I think with the cranial surgery, uh, the field is, is uh, you know, limited, and, uh, and that's one, uh, reason that, uh, uh, but it may be that uh, the robot can do much better work through a smaller space, you know, uh, for endoscopic surgery or uh, anything. And uh, we've also talked about robotics with respect to endovascular surgery. There are a lot of potential applications there uh, because we can avoid, the main thing right now is the human risk. You know, he's at risk, much greater risk of developing leukemia and whatever things. Or anybody that works in endovascular I think a lot of these can be maybe avoidable by you know, using robots. Uh, I think we're just uh, beginning that. But the other side of that is that you know, working in our operating room environment, uh, you know, whenever I'm looking for a circulating nurse, they're not there in the room. You know, they're out doing something. So uh, what I'm thinking about a robotic helper, helper nurse, somebody who can go and do those things for them so that they can stay in the room, you know, uh, so, so things like that, they, it's going to have big application yeah. immediately. Dr. Shaker, I know you operate kind of all over the world from time to time. Can you say a few words, especially to <coughs> the younger residents and in terms of outreach neurosurgery or developing neurosurgery in places where there's a massive need? Well, you know, I've operated in different places. The only thing I would say is that uh, it's a very good experience for the audience, but it's a very bad experience for the surgeon in general. You are never have the same instruments you're used to. You, you have a different award environment. I've always worked with a good surgeon in that place. So usually the people that I worked with are my own fellows. 
So if something happens to the patient afterward, they can manage the complications. So we've, I've given some talk to African nurses. I had a, an African uh, neurosurgeon training with me for six months. And then one of our colleagues has been out in Africa. The main problem there is that when you leave, when the surgeon leaves, the whole system collapses. You know, many of these places, they have a basic problem with healthcare. I think there, uh, I'm, uh, we thought about a system which may or may not work, which is a telesurgery system. Basically, what it is, is that you train local uh, people like PAs to do the surgery, and you, uh, let's say, Dr. Gundikanda is going to monitor for two weeks. He's going to be involved in that hospital. You're going to watch every operation, and if there's something, you're going to show them virtually what to do using virtual reality system. And then the next two weeks, your colleague takes over. So we can donate our time. So a group of people collectively can manage one hospital on a continuous basis. You know, this is something that could work, but uh, that is one of the big problems. You know, we, we feel like, okay, we should train people, but the people that are trained, either they want to stay here or they want to go into elite hospitals. They don't want to go back to the same hospitals. So we, we have to create some system which is sustainable. That's what I mean. That I think sustainability is very important. I, haven't, I don't have a magic formula for that, but I think that I just have an idea using technology, you know, so. Do you have any other comments you want to make? I uh, know. <coughs> Dr. Shekhar, on behalf of the uh, whole group, we're uh, happy to have you with us. And, um, we, I actually knew you were a coin collecting fan, and uh, we actually got you a book about that. Oh. And then a, another book, which uh, Dr. Willis in our department is very proud of, um, edited by a couple of our neurosurgery residents who graduated last year. Oh, great. Oh, Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.